could do a great many things before I came to a definitely anti-social action like robbing a bank, or worse still, working in a bank. To save 75 cents on a six-month supply of toilet paper, we drive across town to the discount superstore, which is owned by some multinational corporation, while the corner shop, which is owned by our neighbor, goes out of business. A defense contractor successfully lobbies Congress to build a billion-dollar fighter jet because it would be technologically superior to the plane the contractor is now building and selling to our enemies. Movie stars make millions for pretending to be someone else. Farmers are foreclosed on for trying merely to be themselves. The world is insane. Hello, I'm Dale Alquist, and welcome to the Apostle of Common Sense, a series of programs where we explore the words and wisdom of the great English writer G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton once wrote, we must hate the world enough to want to change it, but love it enough to think it worth changing. When we talk about changing the world, at some point we have to talk about economic issues, about money and machines and our daily bread. Chesterton deals with these in his book, The Outline of Sanity. It is an outline, in an, it's not a complete systematic treatment, but a collection of essays from Chesterton's own newspaper, GK's Weekly. But while it's only an outline, it is sanity. It represents right thinking in a world that has lost its mind along with its soul. Economics can be an incredibly boring subject with a lot of technical and obscure terms, which is why too often it's left only to economists to discuss while the rest of us ignore them the best we can. One of the problems with the modern world is that in our vague and limited understanding of economics, we think there are only two economic systems to choose from, socialism and capitalism. We've reinforced this limited choice by putting socialism in our left hand and capitalism in our right hand, leaving no other hands. The defenders of socialism tell us that socialism represents security, that all our needs will be taken care of by the government. The defenders of capitalism tell us that capitalism represents freedom, that we're on our own and no one can stop us from going out there and making as much money as we want. What the two systems have in common is that they ultimately are opposed to widespread ownership of property. What the socialists don't tell us is that the natural result of their philosophy is the government ends up owning all the property and controlling every aspect of life along with it. What the capitalists don't tell us is that the natural result of their philosophy is the same result as a game of monopoly. One person owns everything and everyone else owns nothing. And what neither of them tell us is that there is another alternative, a third way, an economic system that is neither socialism nor capitalism. It offers freedom, which is responsibility, and security, which is the protection of the individual and the community. It's based on the widespread ownership of private property. It presumes that small business is better than big business, that craftsmanship is superior to mass production, and that local government is better than big government. This economic system goes by the awkward and misunderstood name distributism. The term distributism comes from the phrase distributive justice, which was first used by Pope Leo XIII in 1891 in his encyclical Rerum Novarum. Pope Leo wrote, among the many and grave duties of rulers who would do the best for their people, the first and the most important is to act with strict justice, with that justice which is called distributive, towards each and every class alike. The wealth of any state is gained only by the labor of its working class. Therefore, Justice demands that the interests of the poorer classes should be carefully watched over so that they who contribute so largely to the advantage of the community may themselves share in the benefits which they create. They have the right to be housed and clothed and fed. 
Private ownership is sacred and inviolable. Public policy should induce as many as possible of the humbler class to become owners. Many excellent results will follow from this. First of all, property will certainly become more equitably divided and men will always work harder and more readily when they work on that which belongs to them. This visionary pope recognized the connection between property and justice. G.K. Chesterton, a few decades later, in The Outline of Sanity, carries this idea forward and shows how neither socialism nor capitalism promote justice because neither promote small property. A pickpocket is obviously a champion of private enterprise, but he is not a champion of private property. The whole point about capitalism is that it features the extension of business, but not the preservation of belongings. It also tries to disguise the pickpocket with some of the virtues of the pirate. The point about communism is that it tries to reform the pickpocket by forbidding pockets. What we'd like to do now is briefly consider Chesterton's criticism of both socialism and capitalism, and then his defense of distributism. Socialism means putting all your eggs in one basket, and then the government takes away the basket. Chesterton says, there's not much difference between the present world and socialism, except for the fact that the present world leaves out a few of the ornamental details of socialism, such as justice, citizenship, and the elimination of hunger, and so on. Socialism does not accomplish any of the things it sets out to do because those who hold the socialist philosophy do not trust the common man and leave nothing to common sense. The thing behind socialism and many other modern things is a new doubt. Not merely a doubt about God, but also a doubt about man. The old Catholic morality really did believe in the rights of men meaning that ordinary men had a kind of authority, that the ordinary man has the right of property, the right to judge about his own health, the right to judge his children's health, and the right to bring up his children to the best of his ability. Now it was in these primary things that the old religion trusted a man, and it is about these things that the new philosophy utterly distrusts him. Chesterton reserves even stronger words for the pitfalls of capitalism. He says that, ironically, capitalism has done all that socialism threatened to do. Under capitalism, a clerk lives in a house he does not own, did not make, and that he does not want. He thinks in terms of wages, of putting in time. It would make no difference to a clerk of a huge corporation if his job were instead in a government department. It makes no difference if he's a faceless servant of the state, or of the rich. The present system, especially as it exists in industrial countries, has already become a danger and is rapidly becoming a death trap. This system rests on two ideas, that the rich will always be rich enough to hire the poor and the poor will always be poor enough to want to be hired by the rich. Paralysis in this system is inevitable. Capitalism, you see, is a contradiction. When most men are wage earners, it is hard for them to be customers. For the capitalist is always trying to cut down what his servant demands. And in doing so, he is cutting down what his customer can spend. He is wanting the same man to be rich and poor at the same time. Chesterton prophetically describes the bluff of the big shops. In 1926, he saw clearly that today's superstores would snuff out smaller shops, the local shops. In almost every way, it would be the customer who would suffer. With the elimination of the small shops, there's no more shopping around. At the big shop, we really can't get what we want. We especially can't get the thing once known as customer service. I think the big shop is a bad shop. Shopping there is not only a bad action, 
but a bad bargain. The monster emporium is not only vulgar and insolent, but incompetent and uncomfortable, and I deny that its large organization makes it efficient. In truth, large organization is always disorganization. It is said that it is convenient to get everything in the same shop, but in truth the monopolist's shops are only convenient to the monopolist. They concentrate business as they concentrate wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer citizens. Now this surrender to modern monopoly does not have to take place. All we have to do to support small shops is to support them. Everybody could do it, but nobody can, can imagine it's being done. In one sense, nothing is so simple, and in another, nothing is so hard. Whether or not we surrender to the big shops is a matter of moral will and not economic law. Chesterton says that we hear a lot of grumbling about the big shops, not because they are big, but because they are bad. He says, when the millionaire owner of a big shop is criticized, it is usually by his customers. When he's complimented, it is generally by himself. And this is proclaimed from the housetop in a voice loud enough to drown out any remarks made by the public. There's a word for this. The word is advertising. Advertising is the voice of the big shop drowning out the voice of the public. Chesterton's preferred solution is that every business be a small business. Where larger businesses are necessary, they should be owned by the employees. And they should be run by a guild, combining their contributions and dividing their results. He believes that small shops can be governed even if they are self-governed. He believes small shops can be supported if we support them. Distributism is democracy. Democracy can work only if property is widespread. Distributism is based on property. It is also based on peasantry. Peasantry is another misunderstood and misused word. The simplest way to understand what a peasantry is, is this. Self-support, self-control, and self-government. It means people produce and use their own goods, make their own laws, and are dependent on no outsiders. Chesterton says, peasants are a multitude of men standing on their own feet because they are standing on their own land. The story of Jack and the Beanstalk begins with these strange and startling words. There once was a poor woman who had a cow. Now it would be a wild paradox in the modern world to imagine that a poor woman would have a cow. Perhaps if she did, she would be a conservative because she would then have something to conserve. But most people call themselves conservatives, but they really are not. The commercial class is the very opposite of conservative because it is forever using new methods and seeking new markets. And whatever an aristocracy is, it is not conservative. And by its very nature, it follows fashion and not tradition. Men living a life of leisure and luxury are always depressingly eager for new things. Now, if we actually had a peasantry, we would then have a traditional class, which would be a truly conservative class. All experience is against the assertion that peasants are dreary and degraded savages. All over the world, there are peasant dances, and the dances of peasants are like the dances of kings and queens. But peasants are also conservative in a very positive sense. They conserve customs, customs that do not perish like fashions. Peasants have produced art because they are communal, but not communist. Custom gave unity to their art, but each man 
was a separate artist. It is the creative instinct in the individual that makes the peasantry content and therefore conservative. The peasant lives not merely a simple life, but a complete life. Chesterton says the core of a community should be a body of citizens who go about the business of producing and consuming, not simply exchanging. A society that overemphasizes trade becomes complex and fragmented, where people have no sense of completeness and certainly no sense of contentment. The modern man in the modern town doesn't know the cause of things. He does not know where things come from. Chesterton says he's like the cultivated fellow who says he likes his milk out of a clean shop and not a dirty cow. That man is not living a complete life. Chesterton does not say there's no place for exchange, nor does he say that man needs nothing from the state. He says these things must exist, but in proper proportion. Neither the trader nor the government official should play a dominant role in society. At the center of civilization, there needs to be a type that is truly independent, a type who produces and consumes within his own social circle. The point is that if we do not directly demand the religion of small property, we must at least demand the poetry of small property. The practical problem in all of this is the goal. There cannot be a nation of millionaires, and there never will be a nation of utopian comrades. But there have been any number of nations of tolerably contented peasants. The aim of human polity is human happiness. But this does not mean that we are obligated to be richer, or busier, or more efficient, or more productive, or progressive. We are not obligated to be any of these things if they do not make us happier. Chesterton's main point, and one worth repeating, is that it is possible to be happy without being rich. Happiness can indeed be a hard taskmaster. It tells us not to get entangled with many things. And one of the things with which we have most entangled ourselves is technology. Now Chesterton says that machines are neither good nor bad, but he does say that becoming dependent on machines can be bad. The point about machines is that we have to be as free not to use them as to use them. Depending on them for our happiness means giving machines the power to make us miserable, which of course they do, as anyone who owns a computer knows. Chesterton prophetically says that machines have become our religion. We have put our complete faith in them. They have served to make us more passive and more narrow, less creative and less free. We're no longer pleasure makers as the peasants are, but pleasure seekers. Machines have created leisure, but we fill even our leisure with machines. Chesterton says we've forgotten the very meaning of the word manufacture, which is to make things by hand. Our churches, our houses, our furniture, our art, all reflect a loss of craftsmanship. Chesterton says we've turned society into a machine for producing tenth-rate things while keeping people ignorant of first-rate things. Big government and big business have used machinery to push us towards consolidation in a rather flat world of standardization. To combat all this, Chesterton says, we need a moral movement. We have to be able to criticize ourselves. We have to be able to resist the tendencies towards consolidation. We have to resist monopolies. We have to resist endless and invasive bureaucracies. We have to resist the mentality that does not trust the common man to be able to take care of himself and his family. Big business and big government are together in revolt against the normal and the ordinary. They are in revolt against the citizen. They do not want the common man to have power, though they are willing to give him a vote, because they have discovered that the vote need not give him any power. But they are not willing to give him a house, or a wife, 
or a dog or a cow or a piece of land because these things really do give him power. Can it be done? Chesterton says, distributism is a thing done by people. It is not a thing that can be done to people. It can be done if we decide to do it. It is also the Catholic thing to do. This does not mean that we must all become peasants, that each of us must abandon our careers and acquire our proverbial three acres and a cow. But it does mean that we take greater control over our economic lives and over our family lives. It means that we cease to be wage slaves and consumer slaves. It means being fair and being free and being faithful. Generally, I like to give the last word to Chesterton, but the distributist ideal is perhaps best described by another writer, a man who was a shepherd, a soldier, a poet, and a king. And like Jack, he was also a giant killer. Like you and me, he was also a sinner. His name was David. And in Psalm 37, he wrote, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. I'm Dale Alquist. Join us again on the Apostle of Common Sense.